Hello everyone, uh, today I'm going to talk about clinical pearls in plexus and basic facial plane blocks. My name is Dr. Shiv Kumar Singh. I am a consultant in anesthesia working in University Hospital Liverpool in UK. So our main goals are to actually have uh, high success rates with our nerve blocks at the same time have complication rates which are minimal. We cannot completely eliminate them. So if you look at uh, the uh, no number of individual blocks we do per year and uh, um, how our success rates goes up, we need to perform around 90 blocks per year. That is each individual block. So if you're doing femoral nerve block, you want to become an expert in it, then you need to be doing around approximately 90 blocks per year to have a good success rate. As your success rates goes up, your complication rates comes down, almost comes down to 0% when you actually do almost 90 to 100 blocks, that is for individual nerves every year. So we try, we fail, we fail, we try again till we succeed. That is the cycle most of us uh, go through. At times, we might actually try for the first time to succeed and we get overconfident and then we fail and then we can actually lose our confidence but never actually uh, lose your uh, you know faith in that. Try again. You will again, may fail again, try again till you succeed. So how do you minimize your complications? All right, so you have, uh, this is your rate, low success rate of complication. You want to actually increase your success rate and reduce your complications. So like I have said, one thing is you actually keep doing those blocks. More blocks you do, the more your success rate will go down, uh, go up, and so will uh, your complications rate come down. So if we look at complications, some complications are common to all nerve blocks. And one thing you don't want to do is wrong side block. Other is to actually not have local anesthetic systemic toxicity. Failures, we will always have to accept them. So wrong side blocks are never ever events. You do not want that to be happening in your practice at all. And why do they occur? They occur because of distractions. They happen because there might be a long gap between the who checklist and the block. They might happen because there is social activity in the anesthesia room. People are chatting and discussing things and distracting. And there are human errors. There are people who are still confused between left and right when looking at others. So stop before you block was introduced a few years ago. It is now followed by UK, US, Australia, everywhere. So it is actually a notice should be stuck wherever you do nerve blocks. And this is notice for anesthetists and anesthetic assistants and our people. And this is a stop moment that should take place just before you insert a needle into a patient. Check the surgical site marking. Check for the site and site of the block. Okay. The second thing is local anesthetic systemic toxicity. And for this, we need to, to learn to <clears throat> train ourselves, to recognize them, assess them, and manage them. Okay. So you don't want to miss the last tram. Okay. You miss the last tram, you actually miss your destination. So what is this tram? So the first T of this is training, so you need to know your anatomy. You need to learn to aspirate before you inject for everything. Every five ml of injection should be followed by an aspiration. Okay. We all know that neurovascular bundles exist. Wherever there are nerves, there are going to be some blood vessels. So it's easy to actually inject into a blood vessel if you don't aspirate before you inject. We need to be able to recognize the signs of systemic toxicity. Are they CNS system or have they progressed to cardiac arrest? So CNS symptoms are always early. Cardiac symptoms occur much, much later. 
And we need to assess at what stage it is. Is it just numbness of the tongue or the patient has gone to respiratory failure, cardiac failure? So if the patient is under general anesthesia or under sedation, you may not be able to recognize some of these uh, symptoms, signs and symptoms like, you know, convulsions, coma, or respiratory arrest. Cardiac arrest, obviously, with ECG, we will actually come to know. That's absolutely too late. So managing uh, the uh, uh, last, uh, there are a few things you need to actually remember. One thing is that you need to reduce individual epinephrine boluses to less than one microgram per kg. And second thing, you need to avoid vasopressin, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, or other local anesthetic during management of last. You need to stop injecting your LA, of course. You need to call for help. Make sure that the last rescue kit that includes intralipid is available. And you need to remember that resuscitation may be prolonged in cases of last. Airway management, which we are all used to, patients should be given 100% oxygen. And you avoid hyperventilation. Okay. So acidosis is okay, but alkalosis is not good because that actually increases the systemic toxicity. If the patient is throwing scissors, then we need to use benzodiazepines. And hypertension and bradycardia should be treated accordingly. And if it proceeds to a pulseless activity, then you will have to start cardiopulmonary resuscitation as you would do in any cardiac arrest situation. So the main uh, thing for treating uh, last is intralipid. Okay, so you need to remember that we need to actually have 20% intralipid uh, available in all theaters or any, any uh, you know, uh, place where we are going to do any blocks. And precise volume of flow rates are not crucial at all. Okay, you just to give uh, intralipid, just rush it through, give a bolus of at least 100 ml over so two to three minutes. And this can be followed by infusion over 15 to 20 minutes. You can give around 200 to 250 ml. And sometimes you might have to rebolus them uh, till uh, the, you actually have a good response. Uh, only remember that the maximum uh, dose is uh, should to be kept should not exceed more than 12 ml per kg. And you need to continue monitoring if uh, the, if there's been a cardiovascular event, so at least for four to six hours. And if there's just been a simple CNS uh, event, uh, you know, you, just two hours is okay. The second thing, or third thing, is failed blocks or patchy blocks or total failures. You have to accept the more you do, you are going to get failures. Okay, that's that's not a big thing. So, looking at plexus and facial plane blocks, failures can happen because you did not get the right response, and you still injected local anesthetic, or you inject local anesthetic around a wrong structure. You thought it was a nerve, but it's not actually a nerve. That happens in ultrasound. Or in cases of plexus, or sorry, facial blocks, the LA is deposited in the wrong plane. So with the PNS, uh, you can get wrong response. For example, you're doing a uh, interscalene block, okay, and you actually stimulate the accessory spinal nerve. Then you either are too high, or you're too posterior. So uh, the accessory spinal nerve lies posteriorly, and it's higher up, and you get twitching of the shoulders. Okay, shrugging of the shoulders, which it looks like as if you're stimulating your deltoid. So if you inject there, you're not going to get a response. If you're too anterior, you might get stimulation of the diaphragm. You just need to move back. And yeah, say for example, if you're doing a infraclavicular uh, block, and in that case, you might actually uh, be a bit superficial, and you get twitching of your pectoralis major. Okay, you think that you have got a good response and you inject local anesthetic, then you don't actually get proper. If you're doing a femoral nerve block, if you are actually too distal from the inguinal ligament, you stimulate the anterior branch, which supply the sartorius, you see the anterior and medial twitching, and if you inject here again, you may not get a complete block. You need to move a little bit higher, okay, before uh, the femoral nerve divides into the anterior and posterior branch, so you can get a good response. Errors can occur even under ultrasound because when you are actually in the initial stage of training, you tend to actually go for pattern recognition rather than understanding the sonar anatomy. Okay. So this is a supraclavicular block 
and that might look like a plexus to you. And this is the same supraclavicular block that might look like plexus. So you think, oh, I'm going to do a corner uh, pocket or uh, pocket corner injection there, and you inject localness into the co corner pocket, <clears throat> and you get no no response at all. Okay, that is because that is actually your skeletal and anterior muscle, uh, which get inserted into the tubercle, skeletal and anterior tubercle on the first rib. Okay, sometimes that looks like like your muscle. Okay, this is the popliteal fossa block. If you're too medial. You might think, oh, that is looks like a popliteal. No, actually, it is actually much lower down. Okay, so uh, you, if you can inject into that, you're not going to get any response. That is your semitendinosis. Okay, if you're too medial, then that would actually look like a nerve to you. Okay, so pattern recognition. This is a femoral nerve, but okay, you can see up there it looks like after there's a nerve like okay, floating in that. That's your lymph node. Or if you're just lateral to the artery, you might think that is a nerve, but actually just that's adipose tissue. The nerve lies much lower down there. And you can actually look at this video in which the needle is actually trying to pierce the uh, fascia iliaca and inject local anesthetic under that because the nerve lies under the fascia iliaca. So even if you're not able to recognize the nerve, you need to actually inject local anesthetic. There you go under the fascia iliaca and you can actually see both the branches and sometimes actually doing a scan going medial or higher up. Okay, just scanning up, dynamic scanning actually helps you. You can actually see that, you can actually see both the branches of the femoral nerve is actually seen in this uh, video. So blocks, uh, you do a block, you fail, you can repeat the block if you want. You might succeed, okay, or you might fail again. Or you can actually decide, say, well, I've failed once, I'm going to just use a supplementary or a rescue block. Okay. You might succeed in that, but if you fail, then you actually might have to think of discussing if the patient is awake. You need to discuss with the patient and surgeon if the surgery is essential. Or you need to actually think that, is it okay just to go for a general anesthesia? And if you have actually given some local anesthetic in the region, you might actually get some amount of response. So it's important to know your limits, know when to stop, and know when to call for help. Okay, so those things are very, very important. You can do anything, but not everything. Remember that. So plexus and facial blocks, uh, plain blocks, the other things, important things are peripheral nerve injuries. So you need to avoid peripheral nerve injuries and you need to avoid a in the, in the wrong plane. So PNS is about accuracy in delivering the local anesthetic and preventing peripheral nerve injury. Okay. So with ultrasound uh, guided regional anesthesia, uh, some people actually use something called triple monitoring. So you use ultrasound for visualizing the structure. PNS to stimulate the nerves and pressure monitoring to ensure that the opening pressures are below 15 PSI. So you need right kind of equipment. So for ultrasound, obviously you need a good ultrasound. For PNS, you need a good PNS. You might also use nerve locators and good set of needles are important. For ultrasound, you might actually want to have high visibility needles. Uh, these are available, so sonoplex kind of needles uh, where the tip actually have grooves so increase visibility. To prevent nerve injury, it's important to actually use insulated and short bevel needle. The bevels are important, so you see on the left side you see a short bevel needle, and on the right side you see a two heat tip needle. Both of these actually prevent uh, nerve injury. Yeah. So not they're not like hypodermic needles with a sharp. Okay. For ultrasound guided block, it's important to actually yeah, gain precision accuracy. And that obviously comes uh, with doing these blocks more frequently, able to understand the sono anatomy, okay, and having good hand-eye coordination. Hand-eye coordination comes with time with practice. So in this side, you can actually see that we're doing a popliteal fossa block. The local anesthetic is being delivered under uh, the uh, common paraneural sheath. You can also see there is local anesthetic outside the common paraneural sheath. Now, that is under the common paraneural sheath, and you can see the local anesthetic is actually surrounding the nerve throughout. Okay. 
So accuracy and precision comes with uh, more knowledge, uh, comes with more practice. Okay, yeah. So with PNS, uh, it's important to know the anatomy, where the nerves are located, <clears throat> what is the landmarks for these nerves, and you might actually need a finer adjustments to get the precise uh, response you're looking for. It's important to what is your settings on your nerve stimulator. You need to know how the fine adjustment need to done. So this is a, uh, you know, doing a nerve block, median nerve block at the elbow. And you can see how the needle has been manipulated. Okay, do you go medially? Do you go laterally? Okay, and that is also just by five to 10 millimeters. And I will explain now in a little bit more details what these finer adjustments are. Before then, you need to understand the neuroanatomy. Yeah, okay. So this is a uh, sciatic nerve. So we got the common peroneal nerve on the left side and posterior tibial nerve on the side. Now this is a, a very uh, distinct nerve that it has got a paraneural sheath. Both the nerves are covered by a facial layer uh, called the paraneurium. Okay. Within that are the, these two nerves and each nerve is actually covered uh, by a epineurium. And within the epineurium, so there are fascicles. Okay, fascicles are surrounded uh, by our per perineurium. And these fascicles are within the endoneurium, which actually has got uh, fatty tissue and blood vessels. And so this, each fascicle has got monitored and unmonitored nerves. There are blood vessels within within that. You can, you can see the, uh, this is a clear look, so... Uh, um, this is so the uh, uh, perineurium is uh, which covers the fascicle is actually much stronger structure than the epineurium it's multi-layered as well whereas the epineurium is actually uh, it is it is actually not that uh, you know uh, strong as the perineurium and local anesthetic can easily diffuse through the epineurium so you don't have to be within and the nerve, you can just outside the nerve, local anesthetic will seep through. So you, that's where, that is a danger area. You don't want to be intrafascicular. You don't want to be injecting local anesthetic into the endoneurium because if you actually inject a local anesthetic into this tight space, you are going to cut off the blood vessels and you will likely kill that uh, fascicle. So when you're injecting local uh, anesthetic around the individual peripheral nerve, uh, you can be extra neural, it's absolutely fine. As long as you're close to the nerve, the local anesthetic will diffuse. You can inject local anesthetic jabs under the epineurium. Okay, so this is between the fascicles, you can, but just under the uh, epineurium, you can inject, some people like the advocate, and you can inject uh, local anesthetic without very high increase in pressure, but you do not want to be subperineural or intrafascular. Okay, that requires a high pre pressure. The opening pressures are more than 15 psi when you are inside the fascicle. This is the sciatic nerve. In the sciatic nerve, a lot of us actually would like to be uh, subperineural. That's where we aim to be, um, because this is still a extra. Neural injection is just that you are injecting uh, local anesthetic under the common paraneural sheath. Okay. So as far as the nerve to needle distance is concerned, uh, if you're close to around 1 to 1.5 millimeters, the current required is around 0 0.4 to if you're around 1 millimeter or so, the current required is 0.2. So motor response at current less than 0 0.2 milliamps is highly specific for intraneural needle placement. Uh, but it's not sensitive, so you could be with, between the fascicles, within the fascicles, and still not get a response at 0.2 millimeters. So it's said that for nerve stimulation, uh, we most of us would accept uh, current intensity between 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 milliamps. I actually try to be at least 0 0.4 to 0 0.5 milliamp is my uh, target at most time with a pulse duration of 0 0.1 milliseconds. And uh, this indicates a needle to nerve portion that is sufficient for accuracy and safe placement of local anesthetic. You don't want to be uh, less than 0.2 milli. 
So when I'm talking fine adjustment, look at this needle, okay? So you are actually close to uh, the nerve with this needle. And you require, uh, because this is probably maybe less, uh, more than uh, one millimeter away. So if this is say 1.5 to 2 millimeter, you will require much higher currents. And you're saying that, oh, this looks like you keep moving in and out, nothing happens, it just goes off. So if you actually move the needle uh, to the right, the needle will actually go further away from that. And this is just by increase the angle by five degrees, okay, five to 10 degrees. If you move it uh, sort of onto the left side, you actually come closer and you will actually see that you actually get a greater response. So you can do that or you can actually come out completely and uh, then actually go and have a, a different insertion point. So you take out the needle, uh, move to the uh, you know the point just around two millimeters or so, and then go vertically in, and then you will be just above the needle, sorry, above the, uh, the nerve, and get a very good response, and you can inject local anesthetic. Okay. So like I said, if you uh, have uh, the pressure monitor device, uh, well and good, but uh, if you actually are going to do local on your blocks, uh, my suggestion would be that you let go of the needle and inject the local anesthetic yourself. You need to actually get that feel of the pressure required. Okay. If somebody else is injecting for you and if they're not used to it, they can inject the local anesthetic at higher pressure. And if you're on the nerve, you're not seeing it, you can actually blow off the nerve. So you don't want that. What kind of local anesthetic and what concentration you use is up to you. You have to remember that uh, the lower concentration, like 0.25%, uh, takes longer time for the onset, whereas the higher concentration uh, takes longer. It's also that uh, when you have intravascular injection, the higher concentration uh, are actually uh, you know dangerous as well. Uh, not only that the pressure will kill, but also the local anesthetic like bupivacaine are actually, uh, can cause vasoconstriction. Uh, Ropivacaine is much safer, lignocaine is even safer than that. Coming to the facial blocks, like uh, they can be done with ultrasound guidance, or you can do just plain lots of resistance techniques. Uh, what's important for them is it that uh, the local anesthetic need to be deposited in the right plane. And the right dose need to be used. These are volume blocks. You have to actually give volume. It does not, concentration is not uh, important here. You can use 0.25% or 0.2% local anesthetic, uh, but you need to use larger volume. So if you look at the ultrasound uh, blocks, uh, again, anatomy is very, very important. You need to know which plane or where you need to inject local anesthetic and hand-eye coordination is as important as for uh, any of our no or plexus blocks. So here you can see that uh, doing a, a rectus sheath block and local anesthetic is deposited under the muscle over the posterior rectus sheath. Same thing actually happen, happens uh, with the with, with the uh, your loss of resistance blocks. Okay. So here, what we're using, you're using a blunt technique, and we actually advise you to actually feel for the bounce, you know, uh, before you feel feel for the click. And here you're seeing that you're feeling the bounce on the posterior rectus sheath. You do not want to enter the posterior rectus sheath, and this is where you will actually inject the local anesthetic. One of the other things we teach with this technique is that when you actually inject the local anesthetic, and if you're in the right plane you can actually see the local anesthetic will actually seep back. You don't see that uh, as much in a, in a, you know, a, a finer needle, but if you actually uh, use a blunt tip, short uh, needles, uh, you can actually see that. And here you can see that, here you go, here you go, the local anesthetic come out. So if you have injected into the muscle, you will not see this uh, local anesthetic coming back. It only happens as you saw, this is expansion of the space occurs, and you can actually see the com coming coming off. Uh, this is another technique uh, where you're using a rectus sheath block and using short bowel needle. Again, it's about bounce and pop. Uh, okay. One of the important thing is to actually understand what is a cushion effect when you're going through the skin. The skin is a tough structure, so. Uh, let me explain to you with the example. This is a blunt needle on my hand. You can actually see how much I can indent without actually going through the skin. Okay. So when you actually have cushion effect, you might be cushioning the soft 
tissues, that is the fat and the skin, and you might go through the skin as, and the anterior sheath, and you start feeling the bounce on the uh, you know posterior sheath, and and I feel think that that is your first uh, go. And when you go there and inject, you will be in, in the abdomen. So remember the cushion effect. So it's also important to understand that the local anesthetic and rectal sheath is deposited over the posterior rectal wall. You do not actually go through it. Okay. So knowing the anatomy is equally important to that. So in summary, uh, success rates uh, is are important. Obviously, everybody wants to succeed, and you want to have low complication rates. And this comes from you know uh, having good uh, knowledge of the anatomy. Uh, able to understand the sonar anatomy, able to understand where you need to inject the local anesthetic. You need to understand what response you're looking for, okay, and know what current you're going to use if you're using nerve stimulation, okay. Also, it's important to actually go through cycle of performance improvement. Okay, you actually attain skill, you also need to have that attitude. The attitude of actually learning more, acquiring more knowledge, and practicing, and then going through this whole cycle. You do not want to get into the knowledge trap where uh, you do a block, you get, you become successful, like I was saying, first time you succeed for the first time, and then suddenly your confidence uh, level is shooting up uh, into the sky. You don't want to be at that level. So, okay, you need to, again, keep improving yourself, read again, go through it again. It takes years and years of practice to actually reach at uh, the level of the uh, Jedi. Okay. Uh, thank you for uh, listening to this lecture and hope it's been useful. Uh, I can go on and on for each and every individual blocks and facial nerve blocks will take a long time, but this was just a 30 minutes lecture. So thank you very much for giving this opportunity.